this afternoon in icy hot the restoration of Mount Washburn Fire Lookout Tower in Yellowstone National Park. It's going to be done by my friend here, Jay Collin. Uh, Jay Collin, Vice President of the Summit, has over 20 years of experience in commercial construction, waterproofing, structural restoration, and historical restoration. He comes from a long line of experience in the sealant trade and has proven himself to be a top project manager handling some of the most high profile restoration projects in multiple states. Well versed in the restoration and repair industry, Jake has extensive experience in high rise restoration and structural repair and loves to climb and drop and all that kind of stuff. These guys are crazy. <laughs> Construction season on top. 
top of this mountain. Uh, throughout the years, they've made changes to it. Uh, you know, they added this uh, lookout uh, made out of uh, wood that was actually removed shortly after this picture was taken in 1980. Um, and then they added on to it and they brought back in the pre-cash structure, which is now the new lookout tower um, that anybody can go visit and, and enjoy their time up there. Um, so the different components of the structure over the years, um, you know, have decayed at different rates. Um, and so it, it's really fun to see kind of what, they, what they're doing uh, as far as trying to bring tourists up there, keep people safe, and, and get as much time and access in the environment as they possibly can for the tourists. So Yellowstone offers a bunch of its own unique uh, components to working in that environment. Um, some of the major components that you'll see is a sow with her cubs. Now it's pretty cool to see a grizzly bear on your project, but it's not really cool to see a grizzly bear on your project when she comes walking up with some cubs. That's probably the last environment you really want to find yourself in. Um, some of the other things that, that you would run into up there um, would be the marmots, which we already talked about, destroying your equipment, digging into to basically anything and everything that you have on the site. As you start to go down the mountain, you come into black bear territory. Black bears are pretty normal in that environment, uh, a little bit down the mountain. Probably the worst animal in this environment would be the four to 600 tourists that would constantly be vis visiting this uh, tower while we were there. So we had to provide continual access so that they were able to get up and, and enjoy the national park while we were there. Uh, we also had ravens that decided to tear everything apart on a daily basis. Um, but it was also really neat to see the mountain goats, you know, in the middle of the day, sitting out in the parking lot, uh, getting warmed up uh, before the night hours came in. So, um, the conditions. We had extreme low relative humidity in this environment. I'll explain how that impacts a lot of your single component urethanes and silicones and the way that they cure in these types of environments and, and different ways to achieve that curing. Um, you know, it operates very differently than it does in the lab. Um, the short work season. The, the work season at its longest uh, time frame would probably be three months. Um, with that said, that season uh, was never guaranteed, so it was uh, constantly playing it by ear on, on what our time frame was going to be. The low temperatures uh, changed constantly. You could absolutely get uh, a snowstorm in the middle of August right after you got done doing a concrete pour. That wouldn't be un unheard of in that environment. And then the extreme winds and the consistent wind that we had in the environment was uh, constantly dehydrating a lot of the materials that you're trying to install. So it's reducing with some materials your cure time and then uh, increasing your, your cure time in, in other, uh, with, with different products. And then the extreme temperature swings, which we, we were already kind of talking about. Um, so as you, it, as we span around, you're going to see this, this video gives a really good idea of, of what that weather environment is going to look like. Um, and, and it's hard to see some of these storms coming when you're already soft in, or it's hard to see, um, you know, what type of winds or, you know, there, there's just so many components when you're stuck in the clouds on, this, on these types of projects. I love this video, though, because it shows your road coming up. It shows kind of the environment that you're working in. Um, and you go from one view of the mountain and it's completely socked in and you're staring at the other view of the mountain and it's a gorgeous view with, you know, those four to six hundred tourists hiking their way up the buggy all day long. Um, this video really shows the environment you're working in. So this, this video was taken by the crew in early June. Those were 16 foot snow drifts um, that you have to get through to get up to the job site. So there was no guarantee of when we could get started with the project, and there was no guarantee on what our last day of the project was going to be. So pre-planning um, for these types of environments is absolutely key. Um, you can see you're on a shelf road, so getting equipment up to the job site is not easy. Getting materials up to the job site, getting trash off of the job site, um, far from, from easy when it comes to an access standpoint. I don't know how many of you have ever been on a shelf road like that, but uh, if you haven't, now imagine putting a trailer behind you and hauling that trailer <laughs> up that road so that you can get all of your equipment up there. Jake, I'm in good condition, so I'm to get to the top. 
So it's an hour and 45 minutes in good conditions to get up to the top. So our crews on a daily basis were an hour and 45 minutes each direction. So if you forgot something, you forgot it. You are not bringing it back up there with you. What about like concrete trucks? You mentioned pouring concrete. I mean, you're not getting, yeah, so you have to be in a four wheel drive vehicle. There's absolutely no way to get concrete up there. So everything, as far as that pre planning, everything had to be bagged, everything had to be brought up separately. We had to batch everything up top uh, for the project. So there's there's absolutely, from that standpoint, there's zero access. Everything had to be manageable um, to get up those types of roads. And if you forgot a drill bit size that you needed to start work that day? Uh, maybe you get it because there's also no supply. <laughs> if you're not, if there's no suppliers, uh, the nearest supplier is about four and a half hours away. So if you forgot a drill bit, if you forgot a hammer, if you forgot anything like that, um, you know, it's probably a week or two before you would go and get it. So uh, that's one of the things that I go into is the pre-planning for a project like this. There's there's no misses. Um, you know, you really need to think through every step of these types of projects uh, to be successful with it. And when you say an hour and 45 minutes, is that from where your team is lodging near the project? That is not from their home. Okay, so that's no. Okay. Yep. Exactly. So this is a great example of, uh, I was talking earlier about getting a trailer into this environment. The trailers also aren't capable of making the hairpin turns that they need to make with the supplies. There is no potable water available in this environment, so all of your drinking water, all of your working water, everything needs to be brought to the site. So to make these hairpin turns, you would actually use the loader to help lift the backside of the trailer to make the turn. And it wouldn't happen in just one turn. Um, it actually takes a couple attempts to get that truck around these hairpin turns um, to, to get, you know, those are empty, so they're going down, getting a refill. At the same time, you have all these four to 600 tourists that are gonna wanna refill a water bottle because they didn't think properly in getting through a hike like that. So, um, you know, and then on top of that, they use this shelf road uh, that you guys saw they use that as the hiking trail too. So while you're trying to get equipment, materials, and everything else, you're also dealing with these people that are constantly hiking and uh, enjoying their, their time off while you're trying to get a job done. Um, just you know, go further, go back into these snow drifts that we were talking about. Those cones do a great job of kind of showing you. You can see one of the cones is barely just poking its head out uh, through the side here. Um, so that, that's exactly what it looked like when we would show up at the beginning of the construction season. So the snow lattice, um, it, it, this is pretty unique. There's only a few places that really get this type of snow lattice, um, but I wanted to show uh, the winds that are constantly there. I think this picture does a great job of showing that moisture drive that, that we all need to pay attention to on, on some of our projects. It also shows how extravagant the freeze thaw damage on this structure um, really is, and we're going to get into some great, great photos of what that really looks like. But um, you know, the, the towers that were installed by Verizon, you know, they were installed about seven years ago, uh, really added to some of the snow buildup that they're getting on the exterior perimeter of the facility. Um, but the fun part is, is once spring comes in, everybody gets their first access to the facility because there's zero access to the facility for nine months out of the year. And then everybody gets to be at the facility for about three months out of the year. So, you know, it's like Christmas every year. You get to, you get to see what type of concrete damage has occurred, where the snow drifts inside the building might have blown through a door or a vent or something of that nature. So, you know, maybe we go through the bathrooms, observation rooms, and then there's a residence up there for the park rangers as well. Um, as, as part of putting this together, this is now, you know, once we've got full access to the facility, we can start to take a look at the existing damage. And when you start looking at 76-year-old uh, concrete um, that has gone through multiple cycles of extreme freeze-thaw damage, you start to think, where are we sitting with the current values of this concrete? So we started going through and doing some testing and evaluating it. And you know, as you're in the interior looking out, you're like, wait a minute, this is probably gonna be a pulled up repair here. This moisture, I'm gonna point out later where that's coming from. 
Um, but that moisture is actually traveling vertically through these walls and exposing itself in, in different areas as you start to go down the walls. Um, so then we decided that we needed to start getting a ton of testing in. Earlier I talked about six foot snow drifts inside the building. It's hard to believe that that little vent is actually the culprit of a six foot wind drift inside the ladies restroom of the facility. So when we went in in the spring, opened up the door, there's a six and a half foot wind drift that is formed through that little vent on the interior of the ladies restroom inside the building. We started to really dig into it. Um, we pulled four cores from uh, each elevation of the building and, and um, had those tested. We started doing pull-up testing on it. When the cores came back and the average strength of the concrete at the facility was 576 PSI, we realized that we had a different game ahead of us on this one. But the part that makes that really interesting and we'll dig into it a little bit later is the National Historic Society had different requirements set forth on the project. You know, it wasn't full removal, it was save as much as you possibly could, go back with repair orders, and as part of going back with those repair orders, we don't want 5,000 PSI concrete up against 576 PSI concrete. So, uh, can anybody in here tell me why that would be the goal? No, so it, it, it's directly related to the porosity and they want it to actually decay at the same rate with the freeze thaw as the existing concrete so that as they go through and perform these repairs over the years, they're always tying back into the same uh, porosity and density of the concrete and then the moisture uh, will affect it. The freeze thaw expansion and contraction will, will be right in line with each other. So that was, that was the theory that they had on that. A few different opinions as it relates to it, but that's exactly uh, what the uh, Historic Society wanted on that. So, as you start to look around, the damage was consistent and it was absolutely everywhere around the facility. Um, here's some of the pull off testing that we did. We, we performed pull off testing on just about everything while we were there, at every type of surface. Um, and then we also had to test for lead and asbestos and everything else on, on the facility get a better understanding of, of what we were going to be facing because to your point we couldn't get up there and run into the potential of unforeseen conditions uh, we weren't just going to drive down the street and fix a problem you know we, we really needed to make sure that that everybody was on board not to mention the you know national historic representative as well as the national parks service historic representative and then the National Park Service project manager and Verizon and everybody else had to be involved with these with these decisions. So everybody really needed to understand what was happening. Getting anybody out to the facility could take the better part of a month before you could get them out there um, to get some assistance. So we wanted to make sure that all of the testing was in line and that we had answers for everything. Um, here's some more examples of the testing, the pull-out values that we had. Um, some additional damage at the west elevation. This was pretty consistent. Um, you'll see some of the interior shots where you can see the damage goes straight through the interior of the facility. Uh, we had conversations with Verizon because uh, anytime you're working around these types of um, receivers, you need to make sure that it's safe uh, for staff to be in that type of environment. And, and in this environment, it was perfectly fine when everybody was, was there. Um, just some, some more of the damage that we saw in the east elevation. The other shot was the west elevation. Uh, here's a couple of these. You can see this moisture coming out of the wall. Uh, I was talking about that earlier, how you could actually see it on the interior coming out of the wall as well. Um, right up above there is the residence deck, and, and we'll get a better shot of that later. Uh, but they basically had a swimming pool up there. Every threshold to the facility was extremely consistent with uh, with this. Um, we'll see a couple other areas. Uh, they had some oversized doors and then, uh, I'll dive into this. This is the interior, that exterior wall that we were just looking at earlier. Um, so a lot of these we, we were thinking we were going to go full depth. We, we really thought that that was going to be the approach uh, for some of the repairs. Um, the designers and the National Historic Society had a different opinion on how the, that was going to be addressed. So. Uh, a lot of these got injected, and we'll, we'll dig into that here in a little bit. 
a little bit, but this is the restroom that has the six foot wind drift inside the restroom. The vents are right above these windows. Most of the door headers uh, had this same uh, re-entry corner cracking, um, so there was repairs made to the headers. We'll see that in a little bit as well, but we just wanted to kind of give you an idea of what that looked like. So this is the observation deck here. I'm sorry, I apologize. This is the residence deck up above. So this specific elevation right here, uh, on average, had four inches of standing water and no positive drainage to it whatsoever. The tile had uh, asbestos in the tile itself, and somebody thought it was a really good idea to install a traffic coating over the top of the porcelain tile. I still don't understand why it wasn't successful, but when I figure that out, I'll let you guys know. Um, once again, same shot. This is that residence patio. So this patio was actually the culprit of the leaking down into those walls. It actually exposed itself in some areas four to eight feet below this, where it would actually start to cause the efflorescence and escape out through the concrete down below. Um, so, so one of the fixes for this, which you'll see, is going to be that we you know, completely remove this all the way down the structure, remove the existing waterproofing, and then create uh, positive drainage um, for these to clear out some of the moisture. This is the new observation deck that we saw at the beginning. This is a precast structure with a coating over the top of it. You can see some of the delamination in the coating. Uh, that's another shot of the landing uh, that we were looking at from down below. I, you know, I think that damage had been there for a while, but somebody decided that the paint may actually extend the life of that landing. Um, I guess we'll never find out. So now that we can really identify where most of the issues are on the structure, it's time to get to work. And uh, where do you start when, when you start with something like this? Well, we figured the first thing we should do is probably get to a sound substrate. I'm going to use the term a semi-sound substrate because when you're dealing with uh, 576 PSI concrete, it's not going to quite be the sound substrate I'm traditionally used to working with. So we, we had to you know, figure out where to stop um, and, and still get a quality bond and quality product that could last for a while. So as we started digging into it, um, we would take portions of this back, uh, get back into the rebar. The rebar was nowhere near consistent with what we originally anticipated to be in there. You'll see a little, you'll see a few pictures coming up later, but they really didn't use a ton of rebar in a lot of these repairs. So uh, this is a great shot of you know some of the removal in place, some of the prep in place, and then some of the repairs over onto the right side uh, going into place. Um, to the left is once uh, everything on the lower portion had been poured back. Um, from there, it, it was determined that we would go ahead and go with an elastomeric coating uh, on the exterior to try and prevent as much of that moisture intrusion into the facade system as possible. Uh, some more on the east elevation. Um, this is once again the, the ladies room right in here. Um, so this was just really more of the same, getting some of that, that failed and deteriorated concrete out of there and getting it back to a sound substrate. Uh, this is a good example of what we found for rebar in, in the uh, existing concrete or the lack thereof. So one of the, one of the things that we uh, ended up doing is going in with a helical tie system and then uh, we embedded it about four inches, rolled it over and then tied uh, a cage to that uh, helical uh, embed, um, which ended up being a fantastic solution. Throughout the process, it was also deemed that uh, there was a primer needed um, prior to, to putting some of the concrete back into these slabs. Um, instead of a standard SSD application, it was determined that a, 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 an epoxy primer was necessary going back into it. So an epoxy primer was applied prior to most of the, the custom blended repair mortar application on these exterior walls. 
Um, this is really just more of the same. It's showing some of the press and protection. It's, it's um, you know, kind of showing the, the substrate under repair. That header was completely removed in the previous picture, so the header's back at this point in time. Um, you, you have these custom doors all the way around the facility. None of them are a standard size, and frankly, not one of them was the same size as the other one. Um, so it was, you know, going back with this, one of the things that we had brought up was maybe we'll cut these doors out, we'll keep some consistency to it for the future. Once again, National Historic Society and National Park Service said absolutely not, everything remains exactly the way it is. So now we're starting to get to more of an exterior finish product. We're starting to, to dry in the facade systems themselves. Um, you can see those vents are still exactly the same as they were earlier, nothing's changed. Um, the whole time we're working with the Park Service and we're working with uh, the Historic Society to figure out a fix for these vents because six foot wind drifts inside the building does absolutely nothing for anybody at the facility. So it was decided that we could actually abandon the vents. The existing vent needed to remain, it didn't need to be functional, it needed to look the same, as long as it looks the same, you can do whatever you need. So we, as you can see in the picture on the far, the far left is the original vent, the far right is us prepping out those original vents. They've been completely abandoned at this point in time, but they needed to look like they were still in service and like they did originally. So now we're into the first construction season. We're talking about a six month long project and you've already lost your, ex your exterior temperatures, that means it's time to move inside because you can't do anything else on the exterior in the first year. It's time to gain as much more time on the project as possible. So you move to the interior and you start taking care of the uh, interior. It was decided that the interior uh, cracking was not a full depth repair. So we were able to actually get in there and start injection <laughs> on these locations. So. There's a before to the left, there's the injection and in process to the right. Um, we were able to replace all of the doors on the facility except for two. Two of the doors were actually deemed to be original 1942 doors that were in there. So it was decided that those needed to go back through the historic requirements, which means you sand them down, you do as many Dutchman repairs that are, as necessary. You can use putty on those. You do have to use all the original hardware associated to the original door as well. That all needs to be maintained throughout the, the repairs. So these are in process. Um, you have the original conditions to the left. You have a final completed door to the right. We were able to add the bottom kick plate and then we also uh, repaired some of the headers um, with these steel plates that were completely through bolted. Um, then you get to the interior of the bathrooms. Um, so we completely ground out all the floors, prepped all the floors, uh, repaired some of the cracking to the floors at these facilities, and then we uh, installed a siling, or, or, sorry, not a siling sealer, a sealer to the floors. The sealer would prevent any moisture that does get into, in, into the um, bathrooms throughout the winter months from traveling down through the structure. Um, and as well as cleaning up bodily fluids and whatever other wonderful things I'm sure they find in these bathrooms. Um, and then paint the, uh, paint the interior walls with that absolutely gorgeous National Park green. It's uh, become one of my favorite colors. This is a great example of the before and after of the doors. Um, and, and then you can also see that ledge that was injected. Um, and then the original hardware. So we, we uh, re revamped some of the original hardware on the doors and, and reinstalled, it, reinstalled it at these locations. Um, the injection looks phenomenal because it just completely disappears um, when done right and stripped correctly. It was, a, it was a great repair approach. So uh, now we're going to get into the observation room. The observation room was that 1980s precast ad that we had talked about earlier. Um, it was actually uh, a twin T precast structure that was placed, um, and these floors were twin T with a poured wear slab over the top of it. Um, 
knowing the conditions that they had to work in with the high winds, low relative humidity in that environment, they actually lost the concrete pour when this was all put in it in the first place. So they actually didn't have a good finish up on it. It wasn't level, had huge ponding, it had high ridges. Um, so it was very evident that they had lost the pour. They also didn't joint any of the floor uh, over the twin tees themselves. So there was excessive cracking in the floor um, through, through movement that had occurred. So we went in, some of the cracks we, we were able to stitch, some of them we honored and made sure that they were capable of moving properly. We ground all of the floors, removed all of the high spots, um, and, and made it so that there wasn't the ponding in these locations. Um, and then we were able to go ahead, and you can see that we brought some of the joints back in, and then we were able to go ahead and install a, a sealer over the top of that floor as well. So now we get into the next season. So you leave, you literally dismantle everything, bring it all back down that fantastic road, and you come back nine months later, and now you can start with the other two elevations and, and uh, a couple other areas on the exterior. Um, so we got up into the observation deck first. I was talking about the custom doors. As I work on more and more of these historic facilities over the years, still over the years, I still don't understand why people think some things are okay, but they couldn't get this door to fit, and I guess it was the only door of its size known to man, so they decided that they were going to remove the concrete on the floor instead of decreasing the size of the door. It's the only way that they could get the swing. For some reason, nobody thought that a low point on an exterior deck in an area that receives that type of moisture was a bad idea, um, but they moved forward with it anyway. So this, this door that we see here actually was sunk into the deck and became the low point so that they could get it to operate. So we brought in a completely new door. Um, you know, this is just another example of some of the exterior uh, facade repairs to the concrete that were completed. The stringers at the facility were actually in great, great shape. The uh, treads were not, so we brought in all new safety treads. It's gonna promote drainage. It's gonna stop that water from sitting on the steel. Um, and then the real fun part begins. Uh, so the park ranger lives at the facility full time for about three months. Um, so with that, he said, this is the only access to my facility. And we said, no problem. Gonna put a step ladder here for you. You can climb up it, do a couple pull ups every single day to get home. You'll be in good shape. Now, we, we had to provide access uh, so that he could get to that facility at any given point in time. Um, so, this was that uh, landing that we were looking at earlier where they were using the paint to, to, to give it some additional structural integrity. Um, so, this is a great shot of kind of what the existing rebar looked like. Um, when they when they originally installed this, um, and you can see a lot of the deterioration there was obviously being that we needed to just completely remove everything um, and tie in a new cage and repair it. We'll get a great shot uh, here in a little bit of uh, what we what we tied in there, um, but it was a complete removal and replacement um, at, at that stair landing. Great shot of the floor to the left and kind of the progress of what that landing look like. Um, the, like I said, the park ranger had to have access through there the entire time. One thing I will note, you know, is with that low relative humidity and um, with the winds that are consistent there, curing the concrete is one of probably the most important things that you can do in that type of environment. Making sure that you have the right curing compounds on it um, and, and that you're, you're keeping it, uh, keeping the right moisture levels throughout that, that curing process. Um, and it was also a matter of trying to get it done in, in, a, in, a, in a very short window. So you wanted to get in and get it prepped, and then it would have to sit there for a while until we got the right weather window, because getting 5,000, 1 million BTU heaters into this type of environment is not a very reasonable um, approach. So there, there was really a matter of trying to find the right weather window um, to get those concrete repairs in place. Once we got completed with that, we went into the waterproofing over that uh, observation room down below. This is the observation deck. The 
majority of this observation deck is a concrete structure, except for the outside perimeter that's a wooden structure. So uh, the entire deck was ground down. Um, we made sure that there was positive drainage on the entire deck because it really did not have high quality drainage at that point. Um, and then a uh, urethane uh, coating was installed over the top of it. One thing to you know, think about in low relative humidity environments uh, with single component products is that they actually just don't cure. They can take a very long time to cure, whether that's silicones or urethanes. There are techniques to cure those. Uh, misting is a, is a great technique. Now when I say misting, I gotta be careful, Dan would have my head over here. A uh, fire hose does not count as misting. A garden hose does not count as misting. It truly is misting. We do not want standing water on that surface, but we need to get it damp um, so that the, the curing process can actually start to, occur, start, to, start to occur. This product would sit in this environment for five to six days before it would actually tack over. Silicones can sit in this type of environment for a week or two weeks on end before they actually start to kick over. And so understanding that in these environments is really important. We had multiple conversations that we didn't want single component. We wanted a dual component and we wanted to kick it and manage that ourselves. We didn't win against the design team. They forced us into this direction. And so we tried to explain this to them and they later understood exactly what we were talking about. Um, now we move up to the residence deck. Um, once again, we were talking about this tile has um, uh, asbestos in the tile. So it was uh, full removal of this tile. Now, one thing about this tile is the Park Service has been battling this tile for 17 years. We actually found that out much later. Um, but they had spent 17 years battling the tile, battling the leaks, and really couldn't find a good um, answer for what to do here. So uh, our first approach was let's remove everything. But uh, I did bring up earlier, you would see a good shot of what that cage looked like inside that landing. Um, so that's, that's uh, the final cage that we <coughs> thrown into this. So we removed absolutely everything off of the top deck. We removed the wear slab, tile, and then we went all the way down past the waterproofing and got back into the structural slab itself. Um, and then brought back the structural slab, but instead of leaving a four inch trough or swimming pool up there, we thought it might be a good idea to get some positive drainage off of this, um, which really solved the majority of the problems with that moisture getting down into those uh, walls down below. So there's your before, there's your after. Um, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about how the National Park Service and how the Historic Society wants everything to look exactly the way it did before you took it off. So it was decided that we needed to go in with a cementitious overlay um, that we could make decorative that would potentially look like a tile when we got done with it. So to the left we have our base coat with our reinforcement mesh. To the right, there's the slurry coat, so you can see that we can bring it all the way over the wall. Further, you know, continue that positive drainage <laughs> path that we're trying to create. Got our top coat in, so now we know it's actually a waterproof system that we have in there. Now it's time to make it look pretty. So we come in and put a grid in, and it looks just like the pile that we had before, except this will actually handle those extreme thermal conditions that the structure is going to go through without blowing the tile off of it and still offer some of the waterproof um, resistance that they need on this deck and keep the positive drainage in place. So with that, that's a, that's a wrap. That's uh, Mount Washburn. Um, hopefully my presentation wasn't too bad and you don't need some icy hot to get you through the night after that one. <laughs> so if you guys have any questions, um, please feel free. Yeah. I got it. Uh, on the original building on the, the, the concrete, uh, what was the makeup of the existing concrete for 500 PSI? Was there fly ash in there? There was not fly ash in there, no. Um, was there lime putty? There was lime in there. Okay. That's exactly what it was. So when you went back with the repair of mortar, was it more like a time and a or something like that to, to, to mimic the lime putty? So we actually, what was funny is that we ended up sending it in for a like it, uh, basically Petro and then we, we ended up doing a, a 
order analysis on it as well. And then they broke that down into parts for us, and then we were able to rebatch it identically. And based it in the field? Yep. Same. Yeah. So we, we, we pre-batched it, bagged it, and then brought it all up, and then we were able to, to mix on site. And your last American coating, did it have the same problem with the drying as the deck coating? It did. Wow. Yeah, the, the other thing with that is, is we had fears of it freezing overnight. So our windows for the elastomeric coating were very short, um, but we hadn't looked for four or five day windows on that. Cool. Great job. Thank you. You mentioned like the high winds, and I saw some scaffolding that you guys had set up. Is there any special like wall ties or uh, safety precautions you had to take when it came to lifting material or, or setting up scaffold or planning? So, so yeah, so they set um, spider bolts into the wall with nine wire and would tie that off. Um, the big thing about the, the heavy winds was trying to keep everything as minimal as possible. Um, so you really wanted, you wanted to give yourself a couple different areas to work in, um, but you needed to be prepared to, to tear as much down as you possibly could and keep it as refined as you could. The other thing was the tourists, um, and you gotta be careful about really climbing your staff. Yeah. Maybe I'll get a better view if you climb up there, so you gotta <laughs> kind of pay attention to some of that. You also talked about like uh, how important, um, like with your curing compounds, um, with the low level of humidity. Did you guys find yourself abandoning batches of material because it just wasn't right for um, your installation? Um, we really actually were pretty successful with that. Um, we didn't have too many issues. Um, I'm going to give them 150 percent of the credit to somebody else. But uh, the superintendent that we had on this project is, you know, thirty-year veteran of working in just very difficult environments, and his pre-planning and you know thought process and scheduling is, in my personal opinion, next to none. Um, and so he really knew what he was doing. You know, he'd spent a month, month and a half prepping before every trip, um, building out trailers and, and kind of getting everything ready to go. So. And, and then when he got on site, it was truly clockwork. He, he kind of knew these three weeks are going to be my window for exactly what I'm trying to achieve. And if I can get it done in one week within those three weeks, I, I'm going to be successful. One last question. How do you create a project like this? Um, skeptical. Yeah. Very skeptical. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, it's, it's, it's not. You know, we, we had four or five of us sitting around throwing out, this can happen, this is going to happen. Um, you know, what if you forget the, the hammer? What if you forget the drill bit, right? What are those cost impacts going to be? What are the delays going to be? Um, there was another number on this one um, that came in. And later, they, they didn't tell us up front, um, but later we found out there were about half and so they had decided there's no way we're going that direction. Um, and so we were fortunate to, to be involved. Yeah. Jake, what about the, uh, so you were telling me how soft the concrete was. And, you know, concrete long one, you got to be able to, you know, you can't pour real high strength. Did you have to pour kind of lower strength concrete? Uh, yeah, we ended up with just about 600 PSI. Okay. That's, that's about where we ended up on our okay. price. So you never want to mash the holes, right? Or be at least close to it. Yeah. Right? Like, got that <coughs> right. Yep. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Most of the time, livestock of three little things. Sorry, say that again? What's the live cycle of the repair? Um, realistically, I think that knowing the park service and how they kind of operate, they're, they're looking for 40 years out of it, um, or they will get 40 years out of it. Probably. Yeah, so they'll go about it. Um, so the Park Service ended up uh, forcing Verizon to pay for this. Cool. Um, so that, that's their approach on this. But that's that's the end goal that the Park Service had on this. Well, I've seen several uh, parts of it that would have to be maintenance. Absolutely. And, and, and the thing is, is in this environment, and, and we had this conversation with them multiple times, they, you know, they they know they have to, but the 
Park Service will it not do that. Yeah, I, I know that they would like to. Um, you know, they have huge aspirations, but it's difficult for them. I will. I have one more quick question. Zach, you're, you're out of questions. <laughs> <laughs> With Verizon, I've, I've dealt with them in the past on high rise projects. The equipment up there, did it stay active? And was it hot as far as you had to make sure the guys weren't too close to it? So I touched base on that. Yes, it had to stay active. Um, but it was not hot. Okay. So that, that's one of the things that I was talking about. I, I kind of brought that up with some of these receivers. You need to be careful from a safety standpoint. And that was one of our first questions when we got up there was, uh, what's the radius yeah. around this? Yeah. Oh, Zach, that's that's right. Right. Just, but was your cell phone service good? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, <laughs> yeah, the cell phone. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know if those right. And actually, I've been in that environment, and it's not good. Right. <laughs> Jake. All right, Jake, thank you.